ladies and gentlemen. That was very good. Thank you. I'm Rabbi Peter Rubenstein, Senior Rabbi of Central Synagogue. And on behalf of our senior cantor, Angela Buchthal, whom you will soon hear, we welcome you to our congregation. We also welcome you to this Metro IAF mayoral candidate forum done in partnership with the Daily News. Our congregation began in 1846 when the population of our city was fewer than half a million people, of which only 12,000 were Jewish. After moving several times around the Lower East Side, this congregation eventually built this building, laying the cornerstone in 1870 and dedicating the sanctuary in 1872. But in 1998, as some of you may remember, this building was destroyed by fire. When the roof collapsed, the pews were destroyed, and only the walls and the ark, which is before you, remained. The very first question that we asked ourselves as a congregation was, should we rebuild here on this site? Should we remain in this area, in the middle of a commercial and business area, where very few of our members reside, or should we just pick up and move up north to be closer to the residences of our members? Well, obviously our decision was to stay. We knew we needed to remain in the heart of New York City where we had originally anchored ourselves. We rebuilt and then three years after the fire, we rededicated this sanctuary on, listen to this date, September 9th, 2001. And just two days later, this congregation became a symbol cited by our mayor that when the citizenry of this city is strong in heart and soul, when the people of our city care about each other, care about our institutions, and care about our future, we, the people of New York City, will never be defeated. We will be strong, we will build, and we will rebuild. And that's why it's an honor for us to host this evening's forum because just as we as a congregation have for over three decades fed and cared for our neighbors who are in need, just as we provide comfort and solace to the people of this neighborhood and city in times of loss and tragedy, so too we rejoice in the wonder of our city, which we all love. And we look forward to robust conversations about our future as these candidates will do this evening by discussing the issues before us. And now let us hear from our senior cantor, Angela Buchdahl. Central has been a member of our Metro IAF chapter for five years, and it is our first time to host an event like this, and it's such a blessing to have you all here. We are all of us from very different neighborhoods in this city, some of us from different houses of worship, different races, different religions, but tonight we are one people seeking a better future for all of the children in this city. So I invite you to please rise with me for a sung blessing to begin our evening. One. 
beautiful for he spacious skies for be seated. And now it's my great honor to introduce a man who is at the heart of it all. In his greatness and humility, Reverend David Brawley, along with the good people, Reverend Brawley, along with the good people of St. Paul's Community Baptist Church in Brooklyn. I assume you're applauding not only for the church, but for Brooklyn. <laughs> Together, they have helped transform their borough. Tonight, we especially invite Reverend Brawley to this pulpit as the chair of Metro Industrial Area Foundation, sponsor of this evening's forum. Reverend Brawley, it is an honor and a great pleasure to have you here at Central Synagogue. Thank you, Rabbi Rubenstein. I, I paid him to say all those wonderful things. It's good to be here tonight. My name, again, is the Reverend David Keith Brawley. I'm the pastor of the St. Paul Community Baptist Church in the East New York section of Brooklyn. Welcome to the second of three mayoral candidate forums hosted by the New York Daily News and Metro Industrial Aerial Areas Foundation. I want to take this opportunity to introduce Mr. Arthur Brown. We are very pleased to be conducting these events with the New York Daily News. We do appreciate all of the media outlets of our city, but we've had a very long and productive relationship with the Daily News. Without the leadership of the Daily News beginning in the early 1980s, the Nehemiah Holmes had helped lead the rebuilding of Brownsville and East New York, and then later the South Bronx may never have become reality. So we're very happy also to be working with Mr. Errol Lewis of the New York, New York One. who you will hear from shortly. I want to, at this time, uh, welcome Mr. Arthur Brown and ask him if he would come at this time and have some remarks. Uh, good evening. I am the uh, editorial page editor of the Daily News. And first, I want to thank all of you for giving us the opportunity to help you engaged in the democratic process in the second of our mayoral forums. As Reverend Brawley said, the first focused on housing. In March, we will tackle public safety. I also extend thanks to our participants, Tom Allen, John Castamatidis, Bill de Blasio, Joe Loda, John Liu, Christine Quinn, 
and Bill Thompson, thank you for having the fortitude to face the grilling you are about to get. <laughs> Finally, please join me in thanking Rabbi Rubenstein for welcoming us into Central Synagogue. Thank you, Rabbi Rubenstein. So tonight, I am the Daily News designated hitter. I'm speaking on behalf of our publisher, Mort Zuckerman, our chief executive officer, Bill Holliber, our editor-in-chief, Colin Myler, managing editor, Rob Moore, my colleagues on the editorial board, and all members of the Daily News family. The Daily News is the paper of New York's working and middle classes. It's the paper of parents. The public schools, all schools, are critical to our readers. At the same time, good schools, excellent schools, are critical to New York City's future. That's why the Daily News covers schools more intensely than any other media organization in New York City. Thank you. And that's why the Daily News editorial page comments more on ed education issues than any other editorial page. We follow closely and we advocate strongly because there is so much at stake for New York's young people. We insist that all students must be able to reach their full potential. We insist on higher achievement across the student body as a whole. We insist that the schools must guide children to readiness for higher education or for the workplace with skills necessary to succeed in tomorrow's economy. I'm going to presume that everyone here agrees with those goals. And I can say with certainty that there are widely differing and passionately held views about how to accomplish them. On all the hot button issues, choice, accountability, testing, and so on, the Daily News editorial board applies one standard in adopting a position. Does it seem likely to work for the kids? Our partners at Metro IAF ask the same question, but our prescriptions for the next mayor and Metro IAF's pres prescriptions for the next mayor are likely to be very different. That's part of the ball game. That said, Metro IAF speaks with special authority as a citizen's organization that early on had the courage to call for mayoral control and has taken on the challenge of improving schools. Metro IAF's team has succeeded grandly, and they have seen success crumble. They know how hard it is to maintain high levels of achievement year in and year out. Tonight, they want, and you want, and the Daily News wants, concrete answers about getting the job done for the kids from these seven candidates who would be the mayor of New York City. So, again, thank you, Reverend Brawley, and I return you now, the audience, into his good hands. So just as we began last time with a review of the sheer scale of New York City housing and its sheer housing universe, We'll begin tonight with a brief look at the scale and the basic facts of our school system. Our school system, with its nearly 1.1 million students, is the largest in the nation. If it were a separate city, it would be the 10th largest city in the United States, right behind Dallas. More than 160,000 students who are English language learners. More than 180,000 have special needs. 
Approximately 875,000 qualify for meal subsidies. Our spending is nearly twice as much as the national average. In fact, just the city's portion of spending on public education is greater than the national average on its own. More than 550 new schools have been created in the past 20 years. Many New Yorkers don't remember the bad old days of public education in this city back in the 70s, 80s, and even the 90s. And very few try to rewrite the history of those decades. Here's what we saw and experienced and even remember. A bureaucratic and dysfunctional board of education. Dysfunctional because power was spread among a number of political figures who mastered the fine art of finger pointing and avoiding accountability. Local community school boards controlled by political operatives and well-financed interest groups. Elections for school board seats attracted historically low voter turnouts from parents, averaging somewhere around 6%. Those days consisted of a graduation rate stubbornly stuck for decades around 48% and no options for parents and students, particularly in poor communities. That's why in the 90s, in a major op-ed in the Daily News entitled Draining the School Swamp, Metro IAF began calling for mayoral control of schools and other changes. There was no way that the old failing inert culture, the culture of the Board of Education, could have been dismantled, disorganized, smoothly, neatly, and without missteps. We do give some credit where we believe credit is due. We in Metro IAF credit Mayor Bloomberg for staking his reputation on his educational legacy. And at the same time, we believe that the mayor has turned the initial need for disruption and disorganization into a constant presence and growing distraction. The leading status quo of the old Board of Education has been replaced by a frantic pace and shifting priorities by the new DOE. Now we present this history in full disclosure, but the point of this evening is not to tout what Metro has done, nor is it to get caught into polarized positions. We know there's a great deal of anger out there about changes that have been made Great, and a great deal of frustration about changes that have not yet occurred. But we also know that there are people out there who are ready to take action. There are people out there that are ready to hold officials accountable. Tonight is important. Again, tonight is important. Tonight is important. We want to hear how each candidate thinks about the challenge of improving our public schools, and what specifically and concretely each candidate intends to do if elected. The sign says, New Yorkers deserve answers, but I say tonight, our children deserve a plan. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, would you welcome at this time our MC for tonight, Mr. Errol Lewis. Thank you, Reverend Brawley. Thank all of you for coming. As you know, if I'm not at home, the, my favorite place in the world to be is hosting the Road to City Hall, but I'm not doing that tonight because this is actually more important, at least for me, for tonight. Uh, I wanna thank the candidates for being here. We went through um, a very interesting housing uh, session last month, and we're gonna do public safety next month. I want to talk a little bit about what the format is going to be like, and then we'll get right into it, because the folks have a lot of questions for you. This is a little different than the way we did it uh, last month, candidates, and I know not all of you were here last month, so let me just lay it out for you. What we're going to hear is a series of questions from people from all walks of life. Some are educators, some are parents, some are activists, some are not. Um, we're, what we're going to do is ask two of you to answer each question. There'll be two principal respondents to each question, 
and I will name you. I don't want anyone to feel like they're being slighted. Everyone will have a chance to speak, but not everyone will speak on every question. Um, two of you will be the principal respondents on each question. One will be a Democrat, one will be a Republican. Uh, and I'll ask you to confine your responses and focus your responses, but confine them to about two minutes. And um, time permitting, I may be able to let a third person weigh in on that same question, but that really depends on everybody's ability to stay focused and move through it. So we're gonna get through several questions and then uh, on the back half, the last 40 minutes or so, I'll stop us wherever we are. And in the last 40 minutes, we'll have a much broader discussion. Everyone will weigh in on that. There will be a chance to talk about broad philosophy, broad goals, broad priorities. So all of that is to say that in this section of it, it's gonna be focused, it's gonna be straightforward. Uh, I may ask for a show of hands on a couple of questions if I think we might have some agreement on a couple of broad themes. But other than that, it'll be the principal respondents who are answering uh, the folks in the audience, okay? And with that, let us get started. Our first question comes from Kate Callahan from the Bronx Leadership Academy. Good evening. My name is Kate Callahan. I am the principal at Bronx Leadership Academy II High School and a leader in South Bronx churches. There is a serious and persistent problem with new teacher retention in our school system. I work hard to build a great team and develop people into excellent teachers. But almost half of new teachers across the city leave within five years. It's worse in struggling communities, especially in high schools like mine. Even teachers who remain in the profession frequently transfer to another school with less poverty and fewer needs. A quality school needs good teachers who stay. But there has been almost no public consideration of teacher retention. My questions are for Christine Quinn and Joseph Loda. One, how will you retain the best teachers across the city while letting the lesser performers go and improving the many in the middle? And two, how will you better retain teachers in high poverty schools like mine and in schools across the city? Thank you uh, for the question. And let me just start off by thanking Reverend Rubenstein for hosting us today and also Reverend Broly for this, the second of our uh, three forums and everyone at the Daily News, Arthur Brown, the editorial board, and Errol, thank you for taking on another job uh, in addition to <laughs> uh, the road to City Hall. You hit on one of the uh, big problems we have right now in our system, teacher retention. And with that exact goal in mind, keeping teachers and helping teachers who we know can do better, do better, is why I've called for a teacher mentor program. They have this in other cities and it's been very effective. The idea would be to offer senior teachers an opportunity to take a year or two break from the classroom. CUNY has agreed to set up an institute where they would work with these teachers to teach them how to be teacher mentors. You would then pair first year and in some cases second year teachers with this hands-on mentor who can help them do better in the classroom, help them learn from their experience, and also I believe help them get to the best potential that they can get to and increase retention by giving this extra attention, particularly in those really tough first and second years, then the mentors would go back into the classroom because we don't want to lose senior teachers from the classroom in the long term. We've seen this particularly in Houston be incredibly effective in raising the quality of teachers. Let me say another thing I believe will help increase retention is taking down the rhetoric around teachers. I've heard far too often from teachers that they feel that they've been vilified. And we need to stop that and be grateful to every person who wants to be a teacher in our system, whether or not they end up being good at it or not. Now, part of the debate that's ongoing about evaluations is how do you put a multifaceted structure in place that's going to identify the really good teachers and help those, because it's really the part those in the middle that you talked about that should be the focus of this. How do we identify in that group 
through using test scores, through peer evaluations, through hands-on mentorship, those folks who need just a little extra help to get to their potential. That needs to be the focus of what we're doing, and I really think a teacher mentor program will be central to helping us I, bring I, I those a, folks up. I have up. a question about the, about the mentor program. Would there be an element of merit pay there? I mean, would, the, would this person who's mentoring mentor? all of these other people, would they be? Not necessarily. That's not the structure that we've looked at. Uh, you know, we really believe, based on what we've seen in other cities, that teachers, particularly good senior teachers, they want to see new teachers succeed. Right? They want to take their experience and share it with other teachers, but how can they do that if they're in the classroom every day, all day long? So no, that really wouldn't be the structure, and we're very grateful to CUNY, who's agreed to work with us on an institute where we would help the teachers have you, the skills they need. You're assuming, are you sure that there are enough of these teachers in a system with 75,000 teachers? There are enough that this would be we think something so. of real scale, mm -hmm. not just a little experiment? Yep. Okay. Joe Loda. Thank you, Earl, and thank you, uh, Rabbi Rubenstein, as well as Reverend Brawley from Metro a uh, IAF, as well as Arthur Brown and others from uh, the New York Daily News for having us here this evening. Retention of teachers is a very important topic, and Kate, as you mentioned in, in, in your question, it's not just how do we retain teachers, but also what do we do with those lesser performing teachers, and how do we get them to become better teachers. The model for this actually came about in the city of Newark, right across the Hudson River, where they actually have instituted, in conjunction with, the, uh, with their union, actually merit pay, where teachers who work in difficult areas of the, of the city of Newark and in difficult subject matters actually get paid more. There is no reason why teachers are all treated identical. They should be, should be based on performance, it should be based on how difficult the subject matter is and also it's how difficult the school is. And that's been proven in many, many parts of the country that we should be teaching, uh, having teachers compensated not just how long they've been there, but how well they do. And that's an important part of it. I've been, I'm part of, I'm on the board of CUNY, I know an awful, an awful lot about the apprenticeship type program and the training programs that we need for our teachers and how we take our senior teachers consider them master teachers and help teach the junior people how to work in a classroom, how to do the core uh, curriculum that's necessary and create the core competencies uh, for the students. But I do think no one should vilify teachers. As, as Christine mentioned, we shouldn't be in the business of vilifying teachers. What we should be doing is uplifting all of our students and allowing them all to be educated. So I am for merit pay. I am for using merit pay to keep good teachers. I am for merit pay to also as part of the evaluation process. Everyone in this room who's been part of the private sector, or even the government sector, uh, is involved in some kind of performance management system. They're rated or graded every single year, sometimes twice a year. Our students are graded. It's called a report card. We need to do the same thing with the teachers. That's not vilification. That's a way to determine who's a good teacher, who's not such a good teacher, and how do we make them a good teacher? What training do we put in place? As a practical matter, um, merit pay, bonus pay has been talked about before. That would have to be negotiated with the United Federation of Teachers, right? Right. How would you? Well, there, there's a roadmap for it. And uh, the former head of the UFT, who's now president of the AFT, Randy Weingarten, excuse me, was integrally involved in Newark with Governor Christie in determining how the merit pay would work. Seeing, seeing Randy at the table, who I once was at the table with in negotiating contracts and negotiating, negotiating various work rule changes, was a true sea change on the part of teachers and their labor unions, that they're willing to go that extra step to work <coughs> to, to, to make merit pay happen. We've got a roadmap for it, and under no circumstances should Newark be leading the charge in this area. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Let me get a, a, a quick show of hands. Of the candidates who are up here, who's in favor of merit pay? Alan, Loda, and Katsimatidis. Of uh, the other candidates, who is not in favor of merit or bonus pay? Okay. Errol, let, me, Errol, let me just add one thing. I'm not in favor of merit pay, as I've said at forums before, because in my opinion, the data doesn't bear out that it actually yields the results we think it will. I have said in the past, though, that given the crisis we have in our middle grades, it may make sense to look at paying middle grade teachers more than others in tough to staff schools. So I just want to make that distinction for the record. 
Okay, let me, let me ask before we move on. We've got related questions, folks, really. We're not gonna leave you out. Uh, did you get some clarity on your question, Kate? Yes, thank you. Okay, Thanks, thank Kate. you. Thank you, Kate. <laughs> Next up is Josh Vasquez from uh, Bushwick Leaders High School. Good evening. My name is Joshua Vasquez. I'm a teacher at uh, uh, Bushwick Leaders High School for Academic Excellence and a leader in East Brooklyn congregations. <coughs> New York City will sooner or later join with the rest of the state in implementing a new teacher evaluation system. It will probably have four ways to assess teachers, either as highly effective, effective, developing, or ineffective. Two years of ineffective ratings could lead to termination. I want to know, do you support such a system? If no, how will you differentiate between the best and the worst teachers? And if yes, how would you use the system to help improve professional development and, if necessary, terminate ineffective teachers after two years? This is for Bill de Blasio and John Katsimatidis. Let's start with you, Bill. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Errol. Thank you, Josh. I want to just at the outset thank the rabbi for inviting us uh, to his small and modest synagogue. Uh, <laughs> beautiful. Thank you for having us. Thank you to Metro IAF, Daily News, Reverend Brawley, everyone who's participating. Um, and I hope this forum is just as uh, extraordinarily insightful and informative as the last one. Uh, Look, I look at everything first from the perspective of being a public school parent myself. I have 14 years under my belt as a public school parent. I want to say something that I think is a little radical in the context of the debate in this city and this country. My view is most teachers are there for the right reasons, are doing good work, can in many cases get better with support, would like more support, don't get support. That I think is the picture. So I think the central question on evaluation is let's first put the horse before the cart. If most of our teachers are able, let's stop fixating on the small percentage that belong in another, percent, in another profession. Clearly there is that small percentage that belongs in another profession, but I'd like to move the debate toward those who are here for the right reasons, those who can get a lot done. Uh, I've heard a couple of my colleagues say they don't like to see teachers vilified. I appreciate that. My question always is, where were you when teachers were being vilified? But that will be a matter of public record as we all debate over the coming months. The, the, the question on the evaluation system, the state law is a good one. The two-year time frame is a fair one if the measure is not done just on the basis of standardized tests or, or overwhelmingly on the basis of standardized tests. And again, as a parent, I've seen the corrosive impact of standardized tests on kids. It creates tremendous nervousness. It creates a total imbalance in their lives. And it's led to a curriculum over-focused on test prep, and we need a curriculum focused on teaching and learning. But if evaluation is about a one-part portfolio assessment, looking at the actual work kids did in the classroom on that teacher's watch, one-part grades teachers gave kids, one-part observation by principals or master teachers, senior teachers, and then, yes, a part standardized test, that kind of balanced approach can actually get to who is not working out and who shouldn't be in the profession. I think if we go down that road, we'll restore balance and actually have an effective evaluation system in this city. The, the system you just uh, described, Bill, what you think should be in an evaluation system, do you think that you could determine within two years uh, somebody who belongs in a different profession? Absolutely. The combination, I think part of the mistake we're making now is by using less, uh, less helpful measures than we could. I think we're not getting to the kind of answers we could. Clearly, if you look at the whole work of a teacher and you see a problem in year one, you have another year to correct. Um, if it's not working out after two years, I think it's fair to say that's time to move on, in most cases, obviously. But right now, the whole problem is we're not even looking at the whole work of a teacher. Standardized test scores, as we've known for decades, we've said this about SATs for a long time, are simply ineffective measures. They're culturally biased in many cases. They just don't get at the whole reality. Okay. 
Let's turn to John Katsimatidis. Thank you. Um, I agree with Bill that the two years is uh, sufficient and that there should be a mechanism to uh, uh, move out the teachers to another profession that are not good. I do believe that 95 to 97 percent of our teachers are probably great teachers. Uh, but we have to work together uh, with the union, and the union has to work with the Board of Education to separate the, the teachers that are not helping our kids. Number one rule, the kids are number one. Um, and I, I've said the other day, I've had a press conference last week and where, where I stated that there should be forks in the road for some of our kids. Not every one of our kids is meant to be a nuclear scientist. Not every one of our kids is meant to be an investment banker for Goldman Sachs. Uh, the fork in the road should come somewhere uh, in high school, probably the uh, sophomore year, where they can decide that, you know, if they're taking courses that the kids don't like, trigonometry, geometry, calculus, I mean, I even failed calculus. Um, I did. I mean, it's just um, uh, that they should have a choice and go to fork, and purely voluntary, where they're able to go straight to the academic courses and on the other side of the fork in the road, be able to take any kind of courses like learning to be, a, we'll do a public-private partnership with uh, different schools to teach them uh, being a plumber, being an electrician, being a refrigeration man, et cetera, et cetera. You know, the average plumber well, let me, John, John, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me ask you, I, I want to ask you to answer his question, though. He's asking about teacher I'm, evaluations. I'm, yes, I believe. Under I the said, current system. Would you, if you let me answer, I'll, I'll do it. Uh, I, be, I said I do believe in the two-year evaluation system. I said that, number one. But I want to be able to give these kids that are scared to go back to school and they end up dropping out because they don't want to face their teachers and say, I can't do the calculus, or I can't do the, the trigonometry or the, the geometry. That's not fair to the kids. Give them another choice. Let them become an electrician, a plumber, whatever, earn 100 grand a year, instead of dropping out and working for Burger okay, let, King let, or let, working for Walmart for $8 an hour. Let, let me try Give one more time. Give them a choice to, make, to live the American way and earn a living, earn okay. 100 grand a year, earn a living, and be able to have a family. All right. let, let me try just one more time, and I'll ask you to be brief Please. about this. Um, in a teacher evaluation system, there are lots of different things. There's the portfolio of the teacher's yeah. work. There's standardized tests. There are a lot of debates about what should be included in looking at it. What do you I think said, should be looked at? I, I answered that question right at the beginning. I said that the Board of Education shall sit down with the teachers' union and work out an evaluation system on uh, every teacher that's, let's say, the, the bottom 3%. And it's got to be worked out. You, you sit in a room and you work it out. That's, you know, I'm probably the only person that was a union man. On the, so you were a union man too? USC, Good. USC. I, was, I was a union man, <laughs> okay? Until I got thrown out of the union, they said I had too many stores. Um, but I think labor management sits down and works out problems that's what that's what the solutions are thank you okay let um okay let me let me uh, allow bill thompson i he looks like he wants to say something let me give you 30 seconds what what what, what's been missed and what we've heard just in the last couple of minutes do you think well i think some of it has been covered but the same point a teacher evaluation system has to be multifaceted it has to look at a number of different things. Standardized test scores are part of it, uh, but at the same point, teacher evaluation, principal observation, parent comments. How is a how is a teacher doing? Also, parents have a role in this too. I'd like to see, you know, peer evaluation included in that. That's important also. And then finally, as we look, the one thing that you don't want to do, as you look at a multifaceted way, you also want to make sure that limited English proficient students, LEP students, and, and, our, and students who are in special ed, um, and I hate that word, but students who were there also 
there's an encouragement. Pe teachers aren't worried about bringing them into their class because they're somehow be evaluated in a different way. So we have to calibrate that also. That's a fair way to be able to do things. One last thing, and I'm going to disagree with John in this regard. And I'm a believer in career and technical education also. However, the one thing I've seen is you have to continue to provide support for students in areas like math and science and others. Because what happens is, to say in a sophomore year that you're going to take a student and track them into a different direction, that student changes their mind later, you don't want to be able, you don't want to preclude them from being able to go to college. And some of the great schools that I've seen, like Aviation High School, that teaches students to be able to, when they graduate, they can either go to college or go off and take additional couple of classes and wind up as an airplane mechanic. Those students who are in some ways poorer than their counterparts wind up going to college in higher numbers, perhaps because they have the confidence of having something additional under their belt. So we don't just want to go back and track students and keep them from going on, if they yeah. want to, to higher education or to be able to go to the world of work with the skills okay. they need to succeed. They okay. always have the option Thank to you. go back, Bill. Okay. Always, I said this is purely okay. a voluntary system. You, they always have the option to go back. You got but, some clarity on that, Josh? I still, still listening. Still listening. Yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> well, well, Errol, let me have well, 30 seconds well, on this because I want to well, expand on what Bill Thompson mentioned. I'll, I'll give it to Peer you just, review, I'll give it to just a second. We, we, um, we have a, a student that we're going to hear from. I'm going to thank you, Josh. Sure. And we're going to move you. on to our next question. I, I, will, I will allow you to weigh in, Josh. Thank you. I think teachers could be tougher than on their peers and everybody else because they don't want bad right. teachers amidst themselves. I'll give you just, uh, in, in just a second, John, and I have it planned that way. <laughs> This is Good Elizabeth evening. Charles. Hi. Good evening. Good My evening. name is Elizabeth Charles, and I am a junior and student body president at the Academy for Young Writers, Yay. a public. <laughs> a public high school in Spring Creek, East New York. Thanks to small schools like the one I currently attend, I've developed close relationships with teachers. These relationships have presented countless opportunities for me, both in and out of the classroom. In the past 11 years, 402 smaller public schools and 121 new charter schools have opened. The presence of these newer schools have given students and families in less, in less affluent communities choices that never existed before. Without these options, hundreds of thousands of students would have been trapped in the failing schools that once dominated their neighborhoods. My questions are, one, how will you sustain the new options that have been created in neighborhoods across New York City while at the same time helping large and traditional schools improve? And what specific criteria would you use to evaluate whether a neighborhood needs and wants additional schools? The, uh, the respondents on this are going to be Tom Allen and Bill Thompson. Okay. So thank you for your question, and, and thanks, Errol, and the Daily News, and, uh, and uh, Reverend Brawley and, and Rabbi for having us. So I've, I actually helped create two small public high schools in the city, one called Frank McCourt High School on the Upper West Side for creative writing, so I, I applaud you and your school. Um, I also helped create Eleanor Roosevelt, which is about 10 blocks away from here, so I'm a big proponent of small schools. Uh, and, but I'm a graduate of a large high school, Stuyvesant High School, and I think one of the things that we're very lucky to have in the city now is choices in different neighborhoods. Larger high schools obviously give students the opportunity to take AP classes, have extracurricular activities that maybe you couldn't do in smaller schools. So I think each neighborhood should have choices, and I think the, the, the families in that neighborhood obviously should have, through their superintendent and through par parents uh, who are involved uh, in the local councils, have a say in what kind of schools they have. Um, you know, I, I, I believe that what, what's happened over the past 10 years has been, has been definitely an improvement in this city. You know, just going back to the questions about teaching and, and principles, I think one of the things we haven't talked about yet in this whole equation is, is principles. And I think that's one of the things that I think is lacking right now. Principals <laughs> need to be instructional leaders of their schools. And that, unfortunately, hasn't happened over the last 10 years. The Leadership Academy and some other ideas that are brought in from the corporate sector have actually undermined the educational mission of our schools. 
all, everything else that we're talking about is really, at the end of the day, a dodge when you really need to talk about teacher training and, and principals who know how to recruit and retain teachers. You know, the first questioner tonight talked about a statistic that I think none of us have actually, it hasn't really sunk in. 50% of teachers leave the profession within five years. Think about that for a second. If that happened in medicine or in law, we'd be talking about malpractice suits. We are committing educational malpractice in this city by allowing 50% of our teachers to leave within five years. That has to change and has to change immediately because we're gonna just keep on, you know, insanity is, de is, is defined as doing something over and over again and expecting a different result. We need to have relentless training of teachers. I was a teacher for two years at Stuyvesant High School. I can tell you, as Frank McCord said to me my first day there, it's five shows a day and it's the toughest audience you'll ever face. This is a piece of cake. It, uh, ra it, rather than standing in front of five classes of 35 kids a day. It's, well, a, lo it's a lonely profession. I, I want to be clear on your answer. The question was the yes. proliferation of new schools. Yes. Would you continue it? Do you like it? Yes, we, we need yeah. to give students options. It's great that we have, you know, and again, I think we need to make sure that we retain some of the larger schools in the city because breaking up schools is not, is not the only answer. Okay, Bill Thompson. First, let me start out by, uh, again, thanking our host for this evening. Uh, Reverend Borley, it's, it's great seeing you. Rabbi Rubenstein, let me thank you. Uh, the Daily News and Metro IAF, thank you for bringing together for this part two of the conversation we've been having about the future of New York City. And Elizabeth, let me thank you for your question. You know, first, I hate following, I hate being on a panel with Tom Allen that talks <laughs> about education because he never ceases to mention that he went to Stuyvesant. <laughs> <laughs> right? And every opportunity he throws that in. I'm a, I'm a Midwood graduate, okay, from Brooklyn. And I am very proud of my high school. The question you asked is a question about options. Because that's what it is. Every child isn't the same. Our children learn in different ways and in different schools and in a number of different things. What we have to do is try and provide those options. First, I am not against large schools. As you talk about a Midwood or a Stuyvesant and some others, <laughs> those are big schools. They work, they succeed, they educate our children and do well. There are other schools and other large schools. When you go back and look over a period of years, schools like Boys and Girls High School succeeded at one point until the policies of this Department of Education helped to undermine it and helped to destroy that school. So l let's be honest first. We have to look at, you know, at large schools. Not all large schools are bad. That's the first thing. And well, in some cases- Talk a little bit about how you would uh, assess a uh, community's needs and figure out whether big, small, or what, what might be needed in that community. Some of it is what works. If a school is working, don't undermine that school. In other ways, it is looking at different options. In every community, you don't want to have just a large school. You'd want to create other options. In smaller schools, schools that are focused perhaps in math, schools that are focused in science, schools that have different options and different focuses, those are the things that you'd like to do to provide those options for young people. So that's one of the ways that you assess. Another way, speak to the people in the community, which nobody seems to do anymore, you know, and talk to them about what the community needs. It is also an understanding that we need to return some things to our schools that have been taken out again, like art and music education and physical education, which help to keep, which help to keep young people in school. That's part of an option. That's part of making a school better. Okay. And then the end, and last but not least, it is also in realizing that school closings aren't a aren't educational policy. It is, should be a last resort after you've tried to keep that school open and help it succeed before you close that school. So all of those things are part of providing options for our young people. And that's where we're going to get the best and well-rounded students who are going to do well in the future. Okay, thank you. And thank you, Angela. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Elizabeth. Our next question comes from Angela Pruitt. Good evening. My name is Angela Pruitt, and I'm the assistant principal at Elizabeth School, the Academy for Young Writers, a public Department of Education school. I'm also the parent 
of a public school third grader who's with us tonight as well. Right now, there are 121 charter schools in New York City, but by September 2013, there will be 178. In many cases, they have provided new important options for families and their students. But it appears that charters partially operate under a different set of rules when it comes to students they are likely to accept and how they can dismiss students who are not meeting their uniquely defined school standards. I'd like to hear from you. Will you push and support state legislation to require charter schools to accept and retain an equal share of high needs special education students, students with emotional challenges, the same types of students that we public schools do. Okay. So we've got a specific question, now let's do a show of hands. Who supports state legislation requiring charter schools to accept and retain uh, equal shares of special needs, special education, and ESL students compared with all other schools. Who's in favor of that? Okay, and who would not support such legislation? Joseph Loda, John Katsimatidis. Okay, um, let's get responses from John Liu and Joe Loda. Well, thank you very much, Angela, for that, that question. I want to thank the sponsors as well. I apologize for getting here a little bit late. I had a Black History Month event I had, that had been long set ago. <laughs> And all I did was open it, and then it's still going on right now, <laughs> because I certainly did not sure want again. to miss the substance of today's discussion and debate. Angela, thank you again for your, your question, and I certainly identify, uh, I have a, a seventh grader myself in public school. Uh, he's been in the same school since he was in kindergarten, and I, I think they've done a very good job with him. Um, the question of charter schools, I do think that charter schools have some value. They offer a choice. They offer a relatively limited choice, a small percentage of the 1.2 million kids in our public schools in New York City are actually in charter schools. And the increase, it's a significant increase from 121 to 178, but nonetheless, it's, uh, it, it still will not be a huge lion's share of the school kids in our schools. I think the problem with charter schools is that there's a public sentiment that fears that the the deck is stacked heavily in favor of charters at the expense of the non-charter public schools. And that's, that's why so many people are frustrated with you. Your question was almost a statement that I completely agree with. It has been shown that the students in, char in charter schools are far less in proportion with regard to being English language learners or special needs students. These are students that need additional support, that need additional help in instruction so that they can succeed in their schools. And yet, both in the application process, the admissions process, and the retention process, it seems like charter schools somehow get these kids out of their schools so that at the end of the day, when the charter schools are evaluated, they're evaluated based on a, school, a student population that is largely absent of the special needs students. So that has to change. The other problem with, public, uh, with charter schools is that too many of the charter schools that have been created in recent years are, not, are, are announced as new schools. Now, you know, the, the first couple of times Mayor Bloomberg and Chancellor Klein at the time announced new schools. I, as a member of the city council on the education committee, I was excited, wow, we're getting new schools. But I guess it took a couple of iterations before I and the general public <laughs> started to realize that uh, these schools have a principal, a teacher, students, but they don't have any building. In fact, they've got to put, <laughs> they've got to be put in a building that has other schools already. <laughs> and so the, the co-location mess is the one, is the, is the issue that I think is actually degrading some of the merits that some charter schools may have. So we've got to put a stop to these co-locations because all they're doing is, is fomenting tensions yeah, I, I and divisions let... in the school and in the community. On the other hand, I do want to say that not all charters are the same. There are, there are community-grown charter I, schools. I'm going to let Joe, Joe respond, but if I can ask you specifically, yeah. do you support a moratorium on charters? 
or I, on I, the co locations. The, there's no moratorium on charters because the state laws already has an allowance for dozens of new charter schools. But the fact is, I do, I do believe that if you're going to create a new school charter or not, give it its own space. Don't cram it into a building that already has so no space. More, so no more co-locations as far as you're uh, concerned. I've long, long ago, I called for a moratorium on, on school uh, co-locations as well as on school, lo school closures. Getting rid of some of the big high schools was a, pro was, was a mistake in the first place, and that should never have been sure. done. First off, I, first off, I want to say uh, uh, thank you, Angela, for your question. But one thing that was almost implicit in the question is that there's something different about charter schools. One thing to remember about charter schools, they are also public schools. They are funded uh, by the city and they're funded by the state. And what's important to understand is that they should be held to certain standards. And we have seen some of the charter schools that have failed actually disappear. But more charter schools are working than those that are failing. And I think we owe it to our children, we owe it to our parents to provide that level of choice. I, I don't think I could disagree more with John, my colleague here, John Liu, about co-locations. We can't wait to have less charter schools or build new schools. We need to have the opportunity. We need to have the comp the competition that charter schools provide to regular schools. We absolutely need the opportunity for our children to, to actually learn. To actually say that we need to stop putting charter schools in co-locations uh, or co-locate co them with regular public schools, uh, I think is a mistake. Our children deserve the best possible education. And there's a variety of schools, large schools, small schools, that uh, need to be focused on. As far as closing schools, as John, John mentioned, that um, we shouldn't close schools. We close schools for one reason and one reason only. They're failing the students, and they're failing to teach the students. It's, it's unconscionable, it's immoral to keep a school that is failing our students open. They need to be closed. They need to be reconstituted as new schools, different faculty, different approach. We owe it to our students. At the beginning of the day and the end of the day, it's making sure that our children are properly educated. Errol, I have to say you have that uh, when, when you talk about closing Please schools, you know, we, the, this administration has proudly announced the closures of dozens of schools as if there was some kind of accomplishment on the part of the Department of Education. In fact, it's an abysmal failure. It is an absolute abdication of responsibility when they close a school. And, and let me say this, you know, these, are, these aren't schools that have been around for a couple of years and they, they fail. Many of these schools have been around for a hundred years and over the generations, sometimes they do well and sometimes they need more help. We should be giving these schools that are a hundred years old the additional assistance so that they can maintain their heritage and their tradition okay. of, of, of uh, cl teaching closure, here. closure of schools doesn't mean that the building is closed down and then no one is taught there. The, what happens is that the name of the school has changed, the pedagogical approach has changed, and what's important is that school doesn't okay. disappear. In other words, okay. it's still let's, there, let's but it. you're calling it a different thing. It's a shell game that people we're are gonna, Better teachers, different teachers. Let me do a, it's, it's not a shell game. Let me do a check-in with the candidate. I want to do a check-in with the candidates. We've got to get control of time. There are a couple of questions we want to get in. Your statement of your overall philosophy. So any time taken from that is going to take away from your larger vision, right? So let's, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Um, let's go to Yolanda. Good evening. My name is Yolanda Vega, and I am a parent of a student at Progress High School in Williamsburg, and a leader in East Brooklyn congregations. My son recently graduated from EBC High School which was struggling for several years. <coughs> I was part of a team of parents who worked with teachers and students to get a new principal and turn the school around. Last year, the school went from an F to a B to almost an A. <laughs> but there have been 98 school closed in the city in the past 11 years. That were failing institutions, many of these schools were, weren't educating or graduating their students and weren't turning around. My questions are, do you support the closure of failing schools? If you don't support closing failing schools, does that mean that you won't close a school under any circumstance? 
and how would you rapidly improve a school performance? If you do support closing school closures, what are at least two or three specific things you will do to help a turn in, to turn a failing school around before you close it? Okay, thank you, Yolanda. This question is for uh, Christine Quinn and John Katsimatidis. Chris. Thank you. Well, Yolanda, congratulations and thank you for your work at your school. Thank congratulations you. to your son. We need to recognize that when we have to close a school, it's a tragedy. But we also can't keep sending children to schools that aren't succeeding. Now, the problem here is I believe we've begun to see closing the schools as the policy and a success in and of themselves. That isn't right. What we need to do is take a step back. And three or four years out, and we have tons of data on schools, God knows, right? Look, create a set of factors that would become a red flag warning system for us. When we see attendance going down, scores going the wrong directions, uh, you know, violence and other uh, 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 security related behavioral incidents going up, let's intervene in those schools with extra resources. And we know what works well because we have other schools in the system that are doing well. I would propose we do a system-wide success study. Identify what teachers and principals are doing well in schools that are working. Then when you see a school start heading in the wrong direction, take those successes from other similar schools, apply them at that school. If you intervene many, three or four years in advance, not just give a new principal one year and then pull the plug when they don't turn it around overnight, we will see more schools like yours turn around and far fewer schools have to be closed. I don't say you can never close a school because you can't look a parent or a child in the eye and keep sending them to, into a school that isn't working. But you also can't hold up school closing as a success, and you can't close a school until you've done your best efforts to try to turn that school around. And you know, Bill Clinton used to say, there's nothing wrong with America. That's what's right about America can't fix. I think that's true about the New York City public schools. We have the answers. They're right there in schools that are doing well. Like look at Truman High School in the Bronx, a big school, a lot of low income students, a lot of students who come with challenges. The principal there has created partnership with Mercy College and Bronx Community Colleges. She's turned that school around. Why aren't we taking what she's doing well there and applying it at other schools just like Truman so they can turn around as well? Thank you. That's a very complete and concise answer. John Katsimatidis. <laughs> so stop talking. <laughs> I was going to ask you for an example of a turnaround. You gave it to us. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Um, I went to Brooklyn Tech. I went to Brooklyn Tech when there were 6,000 students there, and there was discipline. I remember the first day in school, we were in the auditorium, and the principal said, look to your left and look to your right. One of your people, one of you is never going to graduate. And boy, does that make you sweat. You have to apply standards. The kids have to know that you have standards. The teachers have to know that you have standards. Otherwise, if you're going to a school where anything could happen, and no matter what you do, no matter what your grade is, you're going you're gonna to graduate to the next course, shame on us. We are teaching our kids how to fail, and that's wrong. We have to teach our kids how to succeed. As far as the school, thank you. You know, if they tried to teach me how to be a pianist, I would fail. If they teach me, if they wanted me to be a mathematician in, in calculus, I would fail. Let's talk about the schools. At what point do we close them down? You know, and I've had various companies or businesses that I had to make decisions in. Sometimes you got to shake it up. And that's part of my business experience. Sometimes you have to close the school, take the teachers, move them someplace, take the management, take the principals, the assistant principals, move them someplace, and put in a fresh set of management, a fresh set of teachers, bring the same students back, but let's give that school a chance to succeed under new management and 
give our kids a chance to succeed and give them a chance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're, we're going to try and I'm going to try and sneak in one more from uh, Norman Fairweather, and then we're going to get to our, our larger uh, discussion. This is going to be for um, Bill de Blasio and Tom Allen. I'm going to ask everybody to be real brief because we want to keep it moving. Thank you, Norman. Hello. My name is Norman Fairweather, and I'm a leader from the First Presbyterian Church in Jamaica and Equal in Queens. Hundreds of members of our congregation are public school students, parents, teachers, and staff. I want to talk to you about money. <laughs> Since 2008, the Bloomberg administration has increased cities funding of the school system by close to $2 billion. But state and federal support has remained flat. That kept school funding constant even as expenses rose for the salaries, busing, and charters. This has meant that all principals have had less money to pay for additional teachers or instructional programs. Most DOE employees are working without a contract. When the contracts are eventually signed, more pressure will be put on the overall budget. My question is, will you hold school funding constant or will you increase it? And by how much? And how will you get more money into the classroom? Norman, I like a man who puts the question of money right on the table. Uh, it's, it obviously is crucial to the future of our school system. Look, I'm the only candidate up here who has said we have to address some of the central challenges facing our schools, and we're going to need new revenue to do it. And the place we're going to turn for new revenue is the wealthiest New Yorkers, those who make a half million or up, if we want to get serious about education. And, and I think it's amazing that we are facing an education crisis in this city. Everyone in this room knows it. How many kids are being left behind? But we are not only not investing in early childhood education, we've been retreating from early childhood education and child care in this city over the last few years. The way to fix our schools is to first, of course, keep our education spending constant. We can't cut any, to say the least. Over time, we have to add. But the one way we can immediately make an impact is with an upper income tax, and I'll tell you exactly what it would do. And again, I'm telling you a plan and how to pay for it. I challenge the other folks up here to be as clear as this. One, universal pre-K, not just the words, <laughs> universal pre-K, meaning every child in New York City at pre-K age will get a full day pre-K seat on demand. Not three hours a day. There's no parent in this room that wants a three-hour-a-day pre-K seat. Full day pre-K pre for every child needs it. And for middle school kids, and my son Dante is just a few years out of middle school, so I can comment with real understanding of the challenges of the middle school years. We all know them. Those kids need extra support. They need extra support staying on the right academic path and the right social path. So my plan calls for three more hours after school for tutoring, for the kinds of things we talked about before, arts and recreation, the things that will engage kids. If we put a small surcharge on New Yorkers who make a half million or more, we will produce over $530 million a year for the next five years, so we can actually achieve that. Okay. Thank you, Bill. Tom. There he goes again. Um, Bill de Blasio thinks the, the answer to everything is to tax the wealthy. This is not going to be a popular opinion, but we're going to drive the wealthy out of New York and then we'll have no tax base. So I don't believe that's an answer. How, however, we, we are spending, as, as somebody said before, we're spending twice as much in this city on, on students than others, other cities in this country spend. We have plenty of money in the system. We're spending it unwisely. Three summers ago, I spent the summer at, um, at DOE, down on, at the Tweed Courthouse, sort of aptly named. There are so many people scurrying around down there doing Lord knows what, 
that if we blew up the Tweed Courthouse the first day that I'm mayor, we would save millions of dollars. There's a, and there's outsourcing of contracts that are going on where we're wasting millions of dollars. We're spending money, we're spending money on testing. Pearson, Pearson Education is making a mint off of the New York City Board of, Department of Education. There are, we're going to face some very tough choices in this next election. Everybody in this room, I think, has to be afraid of who the next mayor is going to be because we have an unfunded liability of all these contracts that are coming up, and there's $10 billion that we could potentially do, and even Mr. de Blasio's tax on the wealthy will not go far enough. We're going to all be taxed if we don't start thinking about this wisely. We have enough money in this education system. It has to be spent creatively. We have to rebuild our schools because the schools in the city are falling apart. I am, I am the parent of, a public ed, of, of two students in the public education system. When I walk into those buildings every day, it breaks my heart, not just for the kids, but for the teachers that have to teach in those, in those uh, buildings. How do we pay for it? We sell air rights above those buildings to developers and have them rebuild those schools over the next 20 years. It won't cost us a dime and it'll allow us to rebuild 21st century schools so that our kids can go to better schools. We need a mayor who can think creatively and who can spend our money wisely and not resort to taxes okay. every time that's what, uh, What's that's your estimate on the air rights number? How much money would, would we it get? Would, it would be a revenue neutral thing. I mean, again, for example, my daughter goes to school on 84th in Columbus. It's a two-story building sitting on probably the best piece of, one of the best pieces of real estate in New York. If we, if we sold the air rights 10, 15 stories to a developer, to ha in exchange for them building a larger K through 12 school there with more seats, it won't cost us a dime. And we can do that around the city. Let, let, me, let me ask um, um, Rabbi Adelson to, um, to come up. Thank you, Norman. Um, Thank you. And before we get into our last session, uh, by a quick show of hands, one contract, which is, I think even Tom would, would acknowledge is more important than all the other ones, is the teacher's contract. By a show of hands, who would be pushing, at least in your first year, for zero increase, a zero percent increase for uh, for teachers. In going forward time. or going backward? Public. I, I think going, the, forward I think going forward or going, going forward or going backward? I think that that yeah. number and that thing is a little more complex. Show of hands yeah. at the Amen. debate here. With Amen. all due respect, Fair this enough. is too <laughs> important a topic. <laughs> I seek consensus. Thank we you. don't always get it. All right. Good. Uh, Good try, Eric. Good try, Rabbi. <laughs> Hi. Uh, Good evening. I'm David Adelson. I'm rabbi of East End Temple here in Manhattan. Uh, my two, thank you. My two children are in public elementary school. I'm also the product of the public school system. The good news is that four-year graduation rates have been steadily rising for the first time in 20 years. Reading scores for third and eighth graders are up, but there remains a huge disparity between black and Hispanic students and white students. And despite gains, more than a third of all students are not graduating, and far fewer are prepared to go on to college. We believe in accountability for ourselves, for our students, for our teachers, for our principals, and for our mayor. My question is, what specifically will you ask us to hold you accountable to achieving in education in four years should you be elected mayor? A straightforward question, we'll let it sink in. I'll ask each of you, I'll ask each of you to take no more than four minutes and everybody will get their four minutes and I'll start with you, John. Four minutes each? Four minutes? All right. Well, uh, <laughs> thank, thank you very much for that question and there's a lot to be loaded into that. Uh, let me just say one thing very quickly about the, the teacher contracts, all right? The problem when the mayor says that there will be no retroactive increases is that it's hypocritical because it, during his tenure, there has been a pattern of retroactive increases in almost all of the collective bargaining agreements. So now he can't, not only does he not want to resolve the issue before he leaves office, but he's now saying what the next person can or cannot do. It's just absolutely hip hypocritical. I just had to get that off my chest here. I would say, you know, I think it's important to have 
universal pre-kindergarten. I've been calling for that for a long time, and uh, l last year I had already proposed a fair tax plan that would generate additional revenues for the city to take care of these critical needs. I think early childhood learning is essential. I have talked about looking even before early childhood from the prenatal days where we have seen in some of the urban areas of America programs that partner nurses with, uh, with moms who are expecting in certain areas of cities to help them ensure that the babies are taken care of even before they reach school age. So that has to be a part of it as well. We then go to the middle school years. The middle school years are critical. Everybody here says that. Uh, my son Joey is in seventh grade now. Uh, I think the schools are actually doing a pretty good job with him, especially his, his critical thinking, uh, because how, how else could a 12-year-old be so perfectly sarcastic to his parents? <laughs> um, <laughs> It, uh, it when, when he is giving it to me, I, I want to rip my hair out. Everybody but named Joey's like that. Two hour, <laughs> two, a couple hours later, I'm always impressed by it. Like, wow, that was, that was a great, great line. Anyway, uh, middle school, but I think what's missing, and this is what I would like to be judged on, what's missing from our public school system is, even with all the emphasis on high school graduations, there is no look at how many kids wind up in college and graduate from college. This is a big problem for economic viability and competitiveness of our city, where only 42% of our residents have college degrees, bachelors or associates, and we are falling behind major American cities. So I've got a plan that will increase the percentage of New York City residents that have college degrees from the current 42% to 60% by the year 2025. This is a goal that other cities have. This is a goal that national organizations have called for because it is universally understood that a college degree is not a luxury nowadays. It's a bare minimum in almost all cases. No matter which parents that you, you ask, what backgrounds they have, they universally agree that a college education is an absolute minimum. So we've got to start gauging our, our public school system on its success of not just producing high school graduates, but they've got to produce college graduates as well. Okay. And that, uh, that's uh, not four minutes, right? It, it just about is, actually. But, but if, I, if, I could, <laughs> if, if, brief, if I could briefly ask you, um, you're, what you talked about with pre-K and what you're talking about with college has a price tag attached to it. How, are, how will you pay for this? There, there, I have called for a budget that does not look at incremental changes from year to year because though the current budgeting system assumes that the previous budget was right in the first place. I call for a fresh start to the budget, budgeting system in the city and that includes looking at all the, the corporate subsidies, hundreds of millions of dollars every year that are given out to corporations and developers that don't wind up giving anything in return to the city. Last week I put out a report that shows that one contractor, Hewlett Packard, owes us $163 million. We should get that back from them. The week before, I talked about a sweetheart deal that Marriott Corporation got that they should repay to the city of New York, $345 million here. And there's many more cases of that where we can reprioritize our fiscal policies. Now, and when we reprioritize our, our fiscal policies, I have no, and combine that with converting our public schools and neighborhoods to true community centers that are open earlier in the morning and stay late, stay open late into the evenings with a lot of services for the community. I believe that many of those, res many of those services can be provided and provided cost effectively. I think the bottom line is we need, it's not just about early childhood, it's not just about middle school, it's about all the way to getting people prepared for their careers. We need to, we need to convert our classrooms into conduits from, from cradle to career. And I will, be, I will be a mayor that will end, once and for all, the school to prison pipeline. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Joe Loda. Thank, thank you, Errol. Um, uh, David uh, asked a question about how will I be held accountable as mayor, uh, and not just for graduation rates, graduation, and specifically to the minority students in the city, who happen not to lo no longer be minority. They are the significant majority, those who are African American and Latino or Hispanic. In addition to graduation rates, which should go up, we also need to focus on their preparedness for college. I've been on the board of City University for 12 years now. 
This year was by far the worst year for New York City graduates from New York City high schools who have applied to the seven junior colleges. 81% of the students who were leaving the New York City public schools were not capable of doing college level education. As mayor, you will hold me responsible. That 81% number will drop and will drop radically because we have to change the way we teach. We have to work with our teachers. We have to work with our principals to make sure that reading and writing and what I used to call arithmetic, which now the academics are call, calling computing, uh, will be taught. And you're going to hold me responsible because I think it's an indictment of our system that 81% of our students are not prepared to do college education. And oh, by the way, these, are 80, these students want to go to college. They have applied to the CUNY junior, junior colleges. It's really important. The next thing that you can hold me accountable for is getting our fair share from Albany. Do you realize that on a per student basis, New York City gets less than the surrounding counties? How dare the folks in Albany give us less money for our students? That level of what I call flat out discrimination on the part of Albany of giving us less money, which would be closer to five to six hundred million dollars, is the money we need so that in addition to getting the efficiencies that Tom Allen talked about, we don't have to necessarily raise the taxes. Uh, that Bill de Blasio is talking about. We need to get our fair share. That lawsuit that was talked about for the CFE uh, lawsuit, it was originally supposed to focus on the fact that we were going to get our fair share. So how did they settle it? They gave everybody more money, and the lawyers involved in it just said, okay, we've got more money. We still didn't get our fair share. We still don't have fiscal equity. I will go to Albany, and I will also go with the, with the UFT. Because this is something, this is common ground between any administration, any mayor, any chancellor, and the president of the UFT and all of the teachers. We find the common ground. That's how we're going to negotiate a contract, when we find a common ground and we work together. New York City deserves to get its fair share, and the inequity has to end. Hold me responsible for all three of those things while I'm your mayor. A, 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 a quick follow-up on the, the college preparedness. Back us into that. What happens in the part of the system that you control that would make that rate drop radically, as you said? One of the things that we have to do is, everybody keeps talking about the focus on the exams that are necessary through, from grades three through eight. We really need to work with our faculty. We need to work with our teachers to have them not train for tests. Train for the core competency of math and, and arts, as well as English and language. Go back to the days, and I remember very, very well when the Regents exam, my teachers taught me the, the subject matter, the core competency subject matter. And then with two weeks to go, we went through the process. We would buy the Barron's books, so we knew how to answer the questions. We knew how to fill out the little holes with number two pencils and fill out the circles. But we didn't spend all year prepping for it. What teachers need to do is teach the core competency so that when kids come out of school, they know how to add and divide and multiply when it comes to arithmetic and not just worrying about taking the test. I, I agree with Bill de Blasio. It, it changes the, the whole tenor of teaching when the focus is on on, on just how you do on an exam. Teach the core competencies. Make the students smarter, and they'll be smarter when they get to college. That's what you have to do. Okay, Bill. Thank you, Errol. Here's what I want to be held accountable for. I think the educational status quo in this city is simply unacceptable, and I want to be held accountable for changing it fundamentally. Let me break that down. One, empowering parents. Parents are the first and last teachers of their children. During the Bloomberg years, parents have been dismissed as an inconvenient part of the process instead of being seen as essential partners in education. It is hard to be involved in your school. It's hard to have a say when a school might be open or closed or co-located. It's hard to stay in touch with your teacher. Parent-teacher conferences, we've all been there. That's not a good experience for a lot of parents. It doesn't help them get more engaged. We need to totally overhaul the system so it is parent-friendly so we can get better results from students. <laughs> Two, we have to, as mayor, I would want to be held accountable for reducing class size. Even four years, we don't reduce class size. 
we're making a huge mistake. That's in part by getting, as Joe Lotus said, really getting our fair share out of Albany. It's in part some of the things we have to do with our capital budget and the way we use personnel here in the city. But you can't have class size at the level it is now and expect to change those graduation rates and the kind of statistics we heard earlier. Three, as I said, if you don't get it early childhood education, if we don't get it the one place where we can make the biggest impact on children's lives, it it's all doesn't make sense after that. This, we know that four-year-olds and three-year-olds are so open to learning. It's the perfect developmental point in their lives to get them on the right track. But we're not investing in that. And I'm sorry Tom Allen thinks all the rich people live, leave New York City. It's not true. I think people who happen to be wealthy will understand there's nothing better we could invest in in our city than schools. And the best way to invest in our schools is early child education and after school programs. We got to stop teaching to the test. That's a given. We've got to actually treat career and technical education like it's just as meaningful as education for those who are college bound. When you look at all of the things that we have to change in this city, it's abundantly clear if we stay on this path, a bunch of kids get left behind. In fact, a majority get left behind in a lot of ways. We have to be willing to say that a system based on the notion of high stakes testing with a lot of failure, with an unwillingness to apply our resources where they're needed most, is not a system that should be continued. In fact, the solution is there staring us in the face. Respect and empower parents. Hey, respect teachers again, too, because if you treat your workforce with respect, you will get a better outcome. And combine that with the right investments, the right curriculum, lower class size. These are the kinds of things that actually would bring education equity. Finally, look what's happening in the world. It's an incredibly competitive world economically. You look around the country, look around the world. Our competitors understand early childhood education. That's where they're putting their resources. They're racing to put their resources there because they understand that's the best way to have every the workforce of the future, the stable, cohesive society, the safe streets, all of that emanates from getting children at the right early moment in life and giving them hope and giving them possibility, and that's something we can do. Bill, I, I got to ask you, um, you, you talk very passionately and specifically about early childhood, but you also, when you say smaller class size, we've already raised and spent your $400 million on, on early childhood and after school. How do you pay for smaller class sizes? It's $530 million, Errol. Excuse me. <laughs> so, because you, one thing we're going to do, when we, when we use this early child education plan to create full day pre-K for every child that needs that 68,000 kids in this city, at this moment, fewer than a third of that in New York City are getting full day pre-K. When you do that, one of the other things you can do is take capital funding and it does mean prioritizing some of our capital funding differently, to create, for example, pre-K centers, where you have a single pre-K center for a series of surrounding elementary schools, for example. That allows you to take the pre-Ks, keep them in one place nearby, and open up classroom space in those other schools. That helps in the effort to reduce class size. So again, some of it in class size is about changing capital funding priorities. We have a lot of things we need to do in this city, but the most foundational for our future, and again, economic future, the future of our public safety, the future of our social cohesion, the future of justice in this foundational investment is education. That also means on the capital side, that's one of the other ways you bring down the class size levels. Okay, thank you. I need a Republican. <laughs> We're surrounded Let's by Let's talk them. to John Katsimatidis. <laughs> It is what it is. I believe, you know, like anybody who's run a company, whether it's Mr. Halliburton or whoever, accountability, borough by borough, neighborhood by neighborhood, school by school, section by section. You make people accountable for success and failure in those school systems, whether it's lower school, middle school, or high school. Accountability. The system is keeping our poor kids poor. 
and that's wrong. It is very, very wrong. We have to be able, don't forget, I grew up on 135th Street. I went to PS 192. Nobody, when I was going to school, nobody said, eh, don't worry, whatever your grades are, you know, you're going to graduate to the second grade and third grade and fourth grade. Don't worry about it. Nobody said that to me. I wanted to do well. I wanted to, to be able to escape 135th Street. And I worked hard. And I did it. And I want to tell every one of our kids in every neighborhood that they can do it too. And give them hope that they too can succeed. With the system right now, we are failing our kids. We are failing our kids in the poor neighborhoods because it's tough. It is tough that a lot of them have single family homes. And I, for the last 28 years, with Mr. Morgenthau, a member of the Police Athletic League Board, and we try hard to take those kids when they finish school, because the mother works till 7 o'clock at night, and those kids, if they finish school and have no place to go and they hang out at the proverbial candy store or the pizza shop, they're going to end up getting in trouble. We are failing our kids. I believe in preschool. I believe in that. And I believe in after school and teaching them arts and, and everything else. But they have to, kids have to know that they're accountable too, that they have to work hard and pass their grades. It's a partnership. It's a partnership between parents, teachers, and management. So I, I think uh, the rabbi's question is really asking you to sort of form the report card. The you report know, if you're, card if you're mayor is. For a year, uh, what are we looking at to the see how you do? The report card is the mayor is the chief responsible officer, the CEO, and all the appointees responsible by neighborhood, by type of school, they have to know if their schools don't improve that they're out of a job, not that we're going to let them slide. Because whether we're letting our kids slide and not making them work hard enough, or making our management at the Board of Education slide, the system is failing. I was shocked that our kids are number 36 in the world in math. Shame on us for failing our kids. And when I'm mayor, that's not going to happen, guys. OK, thank you. Um, Christine Quinn. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Rabbi, for the question. And it's a great question, because the answer to it speaks about what our priorities are going to be as mayor for education. So when I'm mayor, this is what I would want to be held accountable for at the end of four years. First of all, did I actually engage all of the stakeholders in making the system better? Did I involve everybody at the table? First and foremost of that is parents. Had I re-engaged and re-brought parents back into the system? Because we hear far too often from parents that they feel that they are shut out. That's why I released a multi-pronged plan called Parents Matters, including the idea of launching an online parents' university so parents have all the information they need to know to become really actively involved in their children's lives. Two, have we reduced the rhetoric and stopped vilifying teachers and gotten teachers what they needed to be the best teachers they can be? What does that mean? It means implementing the mentor teacher program that I taught about, talked about. Two, it means, as others have said, stop obsessive teaching to the test. And how do you put that in action? You eliminate field testing. Right now, we are losing days and days to field testing. What is that? We pay testing services millions of dollars to conduct tests. We also allow them to use our students as guinea pigs to test out the questions for future year's tests. 
that steals time from the classroom that you could be using to really connect with the student. They can take money they're making, and they're making good money, to conduct that kind of research on their own. I also want to be held accountable by whether or not New York City becomes the literacy capital of America. Let's set that goal for ourselves. And how can we take steps to do it? We can take steps to do it by making literacy part of every class we teach. Right now in New Dorp High School on Staten Island, the principal there, Deirdre, she makes literacy part of every class she has. So in chemistry, you're not just learning about molecules or memorizing the periodic table, you're writing essays and paragraphs about them. And she's seen her English scores and her kids' literacy skills go up tremendously because of that in a real and tangible way. I also want to make sure that we don't leave those New Yorkers behind in our educational plan who have already dropped out. We have 1.7 million New Yorkers right now over the age of 16 who don't have a high school diploma and don't have a GED. Hold me accountable by whether or not that number goes down and the number of New Yorkers who are passing the GED test goes up. That's something we need to set as a goal. We cannot forget those New Yorkers in any way, shape, or form. We also need to extend our school day, extend our learning time so we have more time in the classroom. Some schools have done that through flexible schedules. We need to do more of that so we can have more time in the classroom for teachers, teachers to actually do their work. I also want to take the model of community schools that we've done to some degree in New York. We're working right now in a partnership in District 30 in Queens on expanding community schools and also working with the UFT on this model. The Children Aid Society has done good work. Let's set the goal for ourselves to expand this model much more aggressively across the city. We have seen in other cities when they've done this with a laser-like focus, it has reduced drop out rate significantly. Now, Earl's next question is, how are you going to pay for all of this? So hold me accountable <laughs> with whether or not we reduce the number, amount of money we're spending on outside contracts and drive that money into the classroom to help us have the resources we need to fund these type of projects on a real and ongoing basis. Also, middle grade schools are the part of our system that is still struggling the most. That's why we in the council put in place a middle school task force and then allocated $25 million to help the most struggling middle schools in our city succeed and do better. Let's take those successes system-wide and then hold me accountable by whether or not middle grade schools really begin to improve across our city. And let me just say, I'm confident that if we all work together, parents, the Department of Education, the mayor, teachers, principals, the unions together, we can deliver on everything on I just said and more. And I'm also confident because if you look at the record I've had as Speaker of the City Council, I didn't just say I wanted to expand early childhood education. I got a bill introduced in Albany and passed into law that will make kindergarten mandatory starting September of the next school year, which means those 3% of five-year-olds will no longer be left behind. And when there was a threat of 4,100 teachers to lose their jobs, I didn't just talk about stopping the layoffs. I stopped the layoffs with my colleagues okay. working with the teachers' union and getting them to put up $80 million worth of concessions to help us keep those Thank teachers you. in their jobs. Thank you. So if, if, if we look at countries where education is succeeding, uh, you know, Finland, Singapore, they have the best and the brightest going to teaching. And I think we have to get to a place by the end of my first term where not only are we attracting the best and the brightest to, to teaching, but we're retaining those teachers. In 2010, a report came out by the National Association that accredits education programs in this country. And it said that we have a crisis in America. We are not training our teachers properly. And it called on, and this was a blue, blue ribbon panel with Randy Weingarten and many others in this panel, that said we need to start training teachers with a medical model. In the same way that doctors have to do three years of residency before they go into an operating room, we need to ensure that teachers have three years of clinical training before they get into the classroom. That will then cure our, att our attrition problem of 50% of teachers leaving within five years. One goal that I will have by the end of my first term is that attrition rate should go down to no more than 
the human capital in our schools, whether it's teachers or principals, is the most fundamental thing and the most fundamental paradigm we have to change. We can talk about early childhood education, all these things, you know, college preparedness, these are all worthy goals, but if you don't have the right teacher in that classroom, if they're not trained properly, if they don't feel like they have a principal who's their instructional leader who day in and day out can give them feedback to make them better, everything else falls apart. And that's why we've had this system fall apart for the last four decades. We, and we also have to make learning a joy again for our children. Because the only way that we're going to compete as a society is if our kids actually look forward to learning. Because it's, learning doesn't end when you're 22, especially in a global economy that's getting more competitive. If kids have, uh, think that school and learning is about testing and drudgery, then they're not going to be able to learn when they're 50 and their career has been disrupted by some innovation as has happened in many careers. So we have to figure out how to make school a place of joy and a place where learning is valued and not simply testing and just getting by. One thing that, that Joe mentioned, I just want to elaborate on, is that we must put um, language instruction back in elementary schools, and we have to put science instruction back in elementary schools. 18% of graduate students in America studying science are American. We wonder why we're falling behind globally. If you don't teach kids science in their early grades, they're not going to like it, and they're not going to pick it up later. We need to teach kids languages. In, most studies show that if you don't learn a second language by the age of nine, you're not going to ever learn one. We're starting kids on language instruction fifth grade and sixth grade. That is ridiculous. So that has to change. So by the end of my first term, we will, we will start a very ambitious capital project to rebuild our schools so that we can have at least one third of the schools in the city turning over and becoming 21st century learning centers where there's broadband technology, language centers, things that we, can, that we can educate our kids for 21st century jobs. We will also bring down the attrition rate dramatically so that teachers look forward to coming to school and they will remain teachers so they, beget, they get better and better and they will come to school each day knowing that the principal that's coming into their classroom is not somebody to be feared <coughs> because they're there to find them failing, but somebody who will give them the proper feedback so they can succeed. Because that's ultimately why people go into teaching. They want to succeed. They're not doing it for the money, obviously. So that, those are some of the fundamental changes that have to happen during my first term. Okay, thank you. Bill Thompson. Errol, I, I think I've decided to go and start to use my middle name from now on. It begins with a C because I'll get called on a little earlier. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I think that the first thing, the, the most important thing to begin with, and no, I want to be held accountable for outcomes, for how our students do in school at the end of each year, because I think that's important. The first thing is to change the atmosphere that is, that's involved in public education right now. I don't consider it a badge of honor to be able to say that I somehow just gave away $250 million that could have gone into our classroom because we couldn't agree. So the my way or the highway, or the, my way or the highway doesn't work. We need to work collaboratively first. We need an honest assessment of where our education system is at because whether it's 71 or 81 percent of our young people who graduate, who can't do college level work, that's unacceptable and that's just those who are graduating right now. The graduation rate also, and we're seeing it in those who can't do four-year college level work, graduation, the path to graduation has changed dramatically. So things like Let's see, credit recovery and other things need to stop. We need to go back to an honest assessment of how our children really are doing. Focus in early grades, focus in bringing class size down in early grades, first, second grade, kindergarten, third grade, making sure our young people can read and write on grade level by the time they finish the third grade is important. Having an education chancellor again as opposed to a business person to run the system is important. I'm the former president of the New York City Board of Education. I had the opportunity to work with some excellent educators, people like Ray Cortinez and Rudy Crew. They were educators. They put an educational vision forward for our young people. 
We need to have an educational yeah. vision for the city Pretty of New York. Cool. And I ask and would almost challenge everyone in this room, what defines success this school year? I don't know that we know because there is no discussion, there is no outline of what to expect in a school year. What defines success, not just in four years, each year. Chancellor and the mayor need to be held accountable for that. We need to put that forward so that it's an understanding. Focus in smaller grades, as I said, in, oh, I'm sorry, in smaller class size and earlier grades, more time on task. We look at other places, Massachusetts, has done the extended day in a number of ways. That started to work. We need to do that, particularly with students who need support, who are failing. We talk about trying to close the gap, the achievement gap. Those are ways to do that. Focusing on our students who are having problems and creating that additional focus for them. I want to be held accountable for graduation rates that go up that are real, for reading and math scores that are real for our children doing better. That's the only way, and, and, and defining that success, not each and every four years, each year, because that's important. But reestablishing and bringing back a different environment, a different atmosphere, a collaborative environment, where we work together, teachers, principals and administrators, parents again, and the larger community. We need the business community to be involved in education to succeed also. Right now, Principal for a day isn't the way that cuts it. We need so many other ways. And I don't knock principal for a day, but the business community needs to be involved in so many different ways in curriculum. So when our young people graduate, some of them can go to the world of work with the skills they need to succeed. We want to be a high-tech city? Well, if we don't start earlier, if we don't focus earlier, if our children can't do math on a certain level, and we don't bring those skills in earlier, those jobs will be there but they'll be there for other people from around the country and around the world, not our children. So there's so much that we need to change. There's so many things that I want to be held accountable for and to be a real education mayor. So what, let me what, One question on, on the small class size. I know you, didn't, uh, you weren't part of the, the, the deep dive on, uh, on, on paying for it, but how do you pay for smaller class sizes? If size? you look at the tens of millions of dollars that are being contracted out right now to corporations, uh, in a number of different contracts, bring that money back in-house. We have to work to make sure that we have the skills and we work on skill development, but we need to bring those contracts back in-house. Let's stop the contracting out. Things we used to have responsibility for, professional development and so many other things, not just let's contract it out to all the outside networks, let's bring that back in-house and do it better. Work along with our colleges and other institutions of higher learning and be able to provide that support again. That's how you find the money to do that. What do you think, Rabbi? Uh, thank you all for the <laughs> commitments <laughs> that you've it's made. It's been a while since you asked the question, yes. Rabbi. Thank you for the commitments that we've all heard you make. Some of them were vague. Some of them were specific. We look forward to holding you accountable to them. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we want to thank our, our host institution, Central Synagogue. Give them a big hand tonight. Our moderator, Mr. Ella Lewis. And our candidates, thank you so much. New Yorkers demand and deserve answers. If you want some more answers, join us uh, March 19th, 645, First Presbyterian Church, where we will continue this discussion and we'll talk about public safety. Thank you, everybody. Get home safe. Thank you so much.